turn. That stemmed from the WebRTC work as it's a requirement for that, but um, all three of them are used as a NAT traversal uh, mechanism and specification. And using ICE, when you send out a call, you specifically put all the possible ways you can be contacted. So, for example, my machine at home has wireless and wired, and it's going through a NAT, so it has a NAT address. So within the SDP, it puts all of those address information, and then the remote side does checks to see, hey, what can I get to? What is actually reachable? Um, so using that, it can, uh, it can find the best way to talk to the device, even through NAT. Um, and turn is used as a mechanism for outside relaying, because there's just some instances where the NAT mechanism that's in use just won't allow the traffic to go back. But um, using turn, which is the relay service, it, it has a better chance of making it. So show of hands real quick, who has ever experienced a NAT problem? <laughs> Everyone. So this will help. <laughs> um, you know, it, when we first released the beta, we actually had this on by default just to see what would happen um, because we knew that you know, the SDP, when you have ICE enabled, is massive. Um, and some people had problems, probably I think actually less than we expected. So we actually did disable this by default simply because we did not want to somebody to go upgrade to Asterisk 11 and deploy their system and have it promptly explode, um, or more likely the other devices promptly explode. Um, but if you do have NAP problems, you may want to take a look at this. This, this should help you out quite a lot. Um, yeah, and on that, it's uh, even though it was done as part of the WebRTC work, uh, it is part of, um, it's, it's, a, it's available as part of Chancef, so you can enable it in there for even non-WebRTC endpoints. And it is becoming implemented in more and more uh, soft phones and physical devices. So WebRTC, uh, show of hands, who knows what that is? Yay, WebRTC is making an impact. I was going to say, if you don't, you, the video for your and Tim's talk will be available, so you I have to check that I out. I have another comment on that. Um, yes, the official TMC video will be available for that, but Tom Keating, who's right over here, uh, was gracious enough to take video of that um, using his phone, I believe, Correct. and has that up on his blog on TMC. So if you search for Tom Keating, you can find it. Um, but I will give you a little overview for those who weren't there. So WebRTC is real-time communication built into the browser. And what that means is there's defined JavaScript APIs that allow the web developer um, to use, uh, like, to develop something like a soft phone or something that's uh, real-time communication related. And because this is a standard API, it's going, it's going to work across multiple browsers. And right now, it's available as part of Chrome Canary. And within, hopefully, two weeks, it'll be switched on by default in the normal Chrome. So, um, so it's, it's getting out there. Word has it that Internet Explorer will be supporting it. Um, Firefox, the Nightly's have it. The regular one does not yet. Uh, Safari is a complete unknown because it's Apple and <laughs> it's Apple. A walled garden, maybe? <laughs> uh, yeah, slightly. Um, and Opera right now is a complete wild card. Nobody knows exactly what they're up to for WebRTC. Uh, but the standard specification um, has a few aspects to it. One being that media is encrypted from the web browser to the other side. The other side being potentially another web browser or a gateway like Asterisk. And Nice segue there. Uh, Asterisk 11 does have support for these specifications and WebRTC itself. Um, one of the cons of WebRTC is actually is that it doesn't specify a signaling protocol, so it doesn't specify that you have to use SIP, you can use other things. But for Asterisk 11, we've added support to use SIP for WebRTC. So we've got um, WebSockets, which is a mechanism of talking from the browser to Asterisk. Uh, to, con to transport uh, the SIP packets from the browser to Asterisk itself. And um, as they were doing the specification, they saw, hey, we know that NAT is a problem, so we need to solve this. And they decided to use ice stun and turn for that, like I said previously. So that's where our ice stun and turn support really, uh, really came from. WebRTC is responsible for that. So uh, I mentioned earlier that Asterisk 11 is going to be available soon. It's actually available now. So um, we actually released it just before uh, we came up on stage here. So it is available for download on the site. We'll get the actual, we didn't do all, we didn't get the asterisk.org website completely updated yet, but 
downloads that Astros.org has it. Go try it out. Go deploy it. Go build cool things on Astros, please. And um, let us know how it works out for you, because we're really very excited about this release. Hi, with the you can share to record a call ID, does that work through referred transfers? So that's an interesting question because of course that always gets down into the definition of what is a call, right? Because everybody's got a slightly different definition of what a call is. So what we've done so far is to try to document what will happen during a transfer. And in certain transfer situations, the call ID will persist. Um, that is documented up on the wiki in the description of the feature. Um, and I would be very interested in getting feedback from people as to whether or not the current implementation works for you. Um, if we can continue to define that further, we would love to do so. But what we're really trying to make sure is at the very least you know what's going to happen with the call, with the call ID. Yes? Uh, my question is, what happened to SCF for Okay. I'll, I'll, let the, I'll let the two members of the SEF team here uh, talk about it. Okay. <laughs> well, um, SCF project is not is not being actively developed. It's apparently the way that you know, it's being reported, and it's not due to technical reasons by any means. Um, it was. It, it, it is a very awesome project, and it, technically, it was. In my opinion, and so obviously we're all opinionated people. So in my opinion, it was, it was it's definitely successful. Um, on the other hand, it's it was massive, right? And it was a huge amount of work, and we hit a point where we had to make a decision as to whether or not we had the money to keep doing it. And the answer is no. So for now, Asterisk SCF is on hold. But what we're going to do, and I know Danny has talked about this as well, that we learned a lot as a process of doing that project. Um, an incredible amount of knowledge was learned as to how to go architect things, what's the best way of doing things, what third-party libraries should we be looking at. Um, and we're going to go take those lessons and we're going to go apply them to Asterisk. So when you heard me mention at the very beginning that one of the goals, the two big goals for Asterisk 12 was SIP and APIs, that's a partly a function of the things that we've learned from Asterisk SEF. Yes, I found myself several times during the uh, DEF CON on Monday saying, well, in Asterisk SCF, we did it this way, or something like that, and uh, you know, and we not, may not do everything exactly the same way. In some ways, that's impossible. But like Matt said, you know, we're learning our lessons, and what we can apply from Asterisk SCF into Asterisk, we likely will. We will. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think we've got time for just one or two more questions, if there are any. Any thought um, about maybe just wrapping the switch box set of APIs and making those available on regular asterisks so that we can write things that work for both systems? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, so we actually have been talking about whether or not those APIs would be the things that the entire general community would, would be useful for, and whether or not that's something that's consumable by everybody. So switch box, obviously, you know, it's a PBX, and that's you know, the vast majority of what people deploy Asterisk as is a PBX. At the same time, there are people who don't, right? And so Asterisk is a little bit more, it has a much more general audience than just PBX types of, type of applications. So a lot of the functionality that you would get through the Extend API would be absolutely fantastic and is an excellent approach on doing that, but whatever goes into Asterisk is going to have to have some other things as well. But absolutely, yeah, we've been looking. Thanks for that question. We've got time for one more. So if there's not that one more question, let's say just a very big thank you to these guys. Thank you very much. And actually on the subject of thanks, there's a few other thanks to say. On the fastest dude for dial tone, we need to say thanks to Billy Cheer for participating in getting that competition to the show floor, and I have some breaking news on that. You saw Paul come up and get his free kiss from Alison. We decided, well, you get to keep those gift certificates, and we'll get another set for Russell. 
So that's your prize. Um, now, in fact, talking of the lovely Alison, can I ask you to report for further duties, oh, please? Oh, my goodness, yes. Absolutely. Wow, never started. Okay. <laughs> and uh, what I'd like you to do, lovely Alison, yes. is we've got ten prizes. The first prize is a Digium D40 phone. And I'd like you to pick the first one. Then what's going to happen is if you're the winner, you're going to come out and collect your phone, and you're going to pick the next winner. That's the way this is going to work. There's a system at play here. Okay, so Alison, eyes closed. <laughs> 